different background, and they're acknowledging uh, the reader. Um, it's a little different, different in European comics, and when, when you're making comics, it's important not to be what Will Eisner called a slave to the close-up. People like Hergé would really pull that camera back and show the whole picture. And this is enormously important if you want to build a, a sense of place and, and really show everything that's going on. And in American comics, frequently, there's that sense to keep coming back to a close-up again and again and again uh, in an effort to try to create something very um, uh, dramatic, or at least compete with the ads on the facing pages, but, um, <laughs> but it's actually really, it's, it's, the dy dynamics really come out in dynamic contrast. And that's the thing, is it's a contrast. Uh, but, you know, this is the legacy of Kirby, uh, the framing, framing uh, that's designed to have extreme variations of depth and diagonals, and these were very effective pages in their day. And it's funny, sometimes you can see the alternatives in terms of their choice of frames uh, can be the polar opposite of that. It's almost as if they're going down a checklist and making sure that whatever superhero comics do, they do exactly the opposite. <laughs> this, is, this, is like, this is from Louis Rial, a really wonderful graphic novel by Chester Brown, the Canadian cartoon. So you can see that the choice of frame there and the intensity of the poses and everything are, um, are just ramped down and the camera is completely still, almost going back to that uh, theater-like idea. In fact, Will Eisner talked later in his life about comics as theater more than comics as movies. Choice of image. So many issues. Uh, do, whether, you're, whether you're working in a realistic style or a very simple style, uh, like John Porcellino here, um, uh, it's so important to just communicate. And I think the best artists, regardless of their style, uh, are great communicators. This, by the way, is by an artist named Talk Fetch. How many people have seen the, the work of Talk Fetch? I see one hand, two hands, well, the hand clapping, two hands clapping, one hand can clap, and hand raising. New York, upstate New York artist that, that I think is really fascinating. Um, How do you spell uh, that? Talk Fetch is just, C, uh, excuse me, T-O-C-F-E-T-C-H. Very interesting surrealistic poems. Um, so uh, no matter what kind of image you choose, uh, communication is very important, but now, recently, we've seen uh, an influx of new styles thanks to the web, uh, and new forms of depth cues, uh, approaches like blurred backgrounds, ways of rendering form, techniques like just scanning in the pencils and choking them back into inks immediately without ever inking, or of course things like 3D modeling or, or borderless color. And what's, one of the fascinating things about our choice of image these days is the fact that a lot of ideas that began on the web because they were more natural to the screen have been coming back into print. And we see with things like the flight anthology, we see artists who often cut their teeth on the web or in animation just not even knowing, well, you can't do that in print. And it's just like, well, uh, well, oh, okay, I didn't know that, but it looks great anyway. You know, like this piece by Hope Larson, the idea of color contours uh, with Hope and, or Becky Clune in here, uh, or just fully painted work, which all of a sudden, because people were doing it on the web when it comes back to print, it looks fine. It turns out that we could have done that in print all along, but we were too busy thinking of print as just black line with C, M, and Y, cyan, magenta, and yellow. Um, and then choice of words, so many issues involving choice of words. Probably the greatest revolution going on now is just a, the, simply the choice of content, the types of stories, the sort of writing that's going on in the, the literate graphic novel movement is, is changing comics uh, in all sorts of ways. Um, uh, you know, people like Art Spiegelman really kicked off this, this wonderful tendency to to, to just take as an article of faith that comics could do anything. And uh, also another thing about comics and, uh, that's unique uh, amongst media is that, that, that words and pictures are reflecting their common heritage. And you can see that in, in pages like this by Osama Tezuka, um, the, the, the calligraphic quality of figures, the, the figurative quality of, of words, they, they have a common origin to them. And it's that integration of words and pictures that's so important in comics that I talk a lot, a lot about in the book. Um, Eisner was especially good at this, the idea that both words and pictures are coming forward. The pictures are showing their, their word-like qualities, their calligraphic qualities. The, the words are showing their picture-like qualities. Uh, and then there are all sorts of different ways that words and pictures combine. One of the things that I noticed was that when you have what, what I call word-specific combinations, where the words are really telling the story from beginning to end, uh, very, uh, you know, such that the words alone would tell the story, that gives you a lot of freedom in the pictures. And we've seen people experiment with very abstract approaches. We all see, also see cases like this one from um, David Mazzucchelli and uh, Paul Krasik is uh, their adapta adaptation of City of Glass. Um, we also see cases where the words and the pictures combine in a way where they create an effect that neither could alone. This one plus one equals three um, uh, effect. And you see this very rarely in comics. I, I call it, in my class, I call it the ivory Bill woodpecker of comics, uh, word, word picture combinations, but it's really worth it if you can create that effect. And then of course the whole wonderful synesthetic um, world of sound effects and that, that whole uh, notion of capturing sound in a visual medium 
um, which also works into things like word balloons, which, which Will Eisner, I think, will wisely called a desperation device, that idea, that desperate attempt to represent sound in a visual medium. It's, it's, uh, it's really quite extraordinary that we can do it at all. Uh, doing it well is, is hard, but it's wonderful when it's not. Uh, incidentally, Neil Gaiman sent me this. This is the earliest word balloon. As we, as we know, with, with internet children, shield your eyes. Um, porn, porn and gambling do drive innovation. You see, like, uh, we have the, uh, let's see, the inscription, the, uh, uh, let's see, the girl is pretty, that's the caption on top, and then, uh, hold still, issuing from the man's mouth. So there's your earliest word. Uh, and uh, some people have tried to really capture the texture of sound and voice in word balloons, people like Dave Sim. Um, and then, of course, there's just simply, regardless of how you letter it, there's simply the opportunity to capture the rhythm of, of conversation in everyday uh, interaction between people. And then choice of flow, a whole variety of issues I'm just going to touch on very quickly, uh, involving the, the guiding of the reader's eyes between panels and through them, uh, both in print and on the web. And this is actually where the print and web begin to diverge just a little bit. So, one of the fascinating things for me is the fact that these five things they're kind of universal. They're, they're, no matter what kind of comic you're doing, they're relevant. Uh, and I'll come back to that point in a bit. Now it was chapter one. I'm not... There are like how many chapters? There's like six chapters. But well, the rest of these slides are really quick. I'm not going to take that long on them. Because, because that other stuff, that relates to the whole book, really. But in chapter two, I talk about the, the whole business of creating human beings. Um, and uh, how, it, how you can uh, accomplish that. The reader will always meet you halfway, but if you want to create something with a great deal of specificity. Hmm? Oh, that's kind of Sky. Yeah, right. Hey, Sky posed for that. She was smaller, actually. She's grown since then. Um, and then all sorts of fascinating things about the way we represent life visually and the sort of cues that we recognize, like symmetry is a very powerful indicator uh, that you're looking at, at something sentient, something living. Uh, I talk a lot about character design, how you want to create characters that, that work from, in, from the inside, uh, that have uh, different backgrounds and how those backgrounds interact, have different desires and how those desires conflict with the desires of others. Talk a lot about um, uh, the construction of figures and, and characters. Um, then on to facial expressions, um, the, the, uh, the vital importance of, of those six emotional primaries that Darwin identified a um, uh, hundred and some odd years ago, um, which, which underlie a lot of expressions, how those, uh, how those primaries can be combined for a lot of different expressions. How they combine a lot like color theory, actually. It's, it's very similar to color theory. And then you have the, the, uh, the uh, values uh, in color are represented by the different intensity of expressions. And then you have other elements like uh, physical, ex uh, physical sensations and then the direct communication. Uh, fascinates me too that the, the way that the emotional primaries, the, the basic emotions are all symmetrical because emotion comes from within, it has no direction. Whereas these other things have sources and so you have these more asymmetrical expressions. So I try to deconstruct that as much as possible and show how from just a few simple components, facial expressions manage to represent every color in the rainbow of expressions. Then into, onto the structure of faces, how they work, how they work in sequence, and uh, some, some examples throughout uh, like this, this uh, astoundingly beautiful uh, bit of facial expressions from Kyle Baker. So um, uh, then onto body language, uh, this is all chapter two. Um, but really, honestly, I'm not, it's not proportional. I'll, this will be, I'm halfway through, I think. What, what time am I at? I don't know. Five minutes. I have five minutes left? Okay, well, uh, how do you yeah, okay. Well, I'm going to keep going. Um, so then, uh, a lot of body language, uh, the different relationships between uh, height and status. Uh, it's fascinating looking at the posture of alternative <laughs> comics characters. Um, you know, that, that, that they sort of represent by their posture the, the idea of the weak and the dispossessed, you know, as opposed to the posture of a lot of superhero comics. Um, and we see, you know, all the different relationships of height and status. Um, and then the relationship between imbalance and discontent. Um, and uh, then between distance and intimacy, like in this, uh, this is Eisner again, this, this wonderful demonstration of that idea of personal space as a factor in intimacy and involvement. <laughs> is that something? That's an amazing piece, I always love that. They're a bit about constructing the figure, something I'm not terribly gifted at, but I try to give you pointers. Um, and then on to words and pictures. Oh look, chapter three. Um, <laughs> And um, uh, how uh, words and pictures are involved in this whole business of creating a continuous world, a connected world, from disconnected elements. Uh, different types of word-picture combinations that I touched on back in uh, Understanding Comics in 1993, but more, much more about their practical uses. Again, the integration of words and pictures, uh, sound effects, 
uh, word balloons, uh, different aspects of that. Then a chapter on, on world building, what, a, 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 an enormously important, I think, uh, topic that we don't always address, in the, especially in North American comics. There's a tremendous uh, uh, tradition of world building in European comics, but I think uh, here, uh, because of that sort of figure and backdrop tradition in American comics, we sometimes overlook the necessity to create, occasionally let the reader wander a world, and that's what this chapter is about, uh, evoking the senses, uh, you know, creating uh, convincing um, uh, settings, um, uh, how different cultures represent settings, so such as in manga, often you have uh, uh, scenes represented in fragments rather than in one big establishing shot, and then a bit about constructing those in perspective and the importance of improvis improvisation in comic book perspective, how to think in 3D. Then there's a chapter on tools, techniques, and technology. I finally get around to answering the question, what kind of pen do you use? Something which is sort of question number one, I think a lot of aspiring artists' uh, ideas. And the answer actually would be a uh, Wacom Cintiq digitizing tablet pen. <laughs> but, but I talk plenty about uh, traditional tools and how even the simplest tools can be used to create good work. Uh, the, the, the basic traditional arsenal, if you want to go that route, uh, what each of these tools is for, their history, their effect on artwork, um, I even talk about the Ames lettering guide. Does anyone use an Ames lettering guide? Any aspiring to? You know, they still kind of work. <laughs> Not bad. They're kind of archaic, but they work. Um, and then a bit of a, some of my pet peeves about digital lettering. God damn, I hate those yeah. unmodified ovals with the. Oh, yeah. Anyway, so and how, how, you know, how you can improve that. Um, and then a bit about the cost, just the very, you know, the, the very important issue of, of cost when going digital. Uh, 